Mark Inyowski, a well-being economist, discusses the possibility of a brighter future, muscle testing, and how they relate with one another. When he t showed me that, I went, nah, this sounds like magic. Like, I'm a good Catholic. I, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to believe any of this woo-woo magic stuff, right? So, so for me, my journey down this rabbit hole was interesting because I was trying to discern whether this was a God-given capacity for discernment. And I'm now convinced that this is a serious gift. Um, it's, a, it's a serious modality of measurement that I think will change every, everything in the way we look at investment, we look at anything. If these things are true, as I jokingly said, we actually do have the tricorder. This will change the entire basis of diagnostics in medicine, if you understand what I'm saying. And it's not just me, and you know, anyone can do this. Today we have with us Mark Anjowski. He's joining us and he wrote a book called The Economics of Happiness. He travels all over the world, meeting with governments and corporations, talking about this philosophy of happiness, wellness, and uh, the economics behind it. Welcome, Mark. How are you? Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. I'm very well, thank you. Good. And generally happy. Like, and generally happy. Generally happy. <laughs> you, you mentioned briefly some maybe concepts based around like metaphysics and energetics. Um, can you speak a little bit on, on that? Well, I've you know, first of all, I, I like, I'm pretty fussy about the etymological roots of words. Um, so if we go back, even people say, well, why did you write the book, The Economics of Happiness? And, and I said, well, there's two important words. How, how do you bring economy and happiness together? Well, it actually, the common root is well-being because economy means in Greek household stewardship. So household stewardship is about the well-being of the members of the household. Um, that's what the word wealth actually means in the old English, it means the conditions of well-being. And in Greek, the word happiness, oidaimonia, means well-being of your spirit uh, or well-being of your soul. So isn't, isn't that interesting? So with, with my accounting background, it's like, well, what is then wealth accounting if not well-being accounting? And how do you measure the well-being of your spirit? Well, that's going to be tricky, right? I mean, how can I, can I ever evaluate the condition of your soul? No. Um, what about energetically? What about so-called consciousness. Well, what is consciousness? Um, and having studied the work of David R. Hawkins, clinical psych psychiatrist in New York, he developed his PhD thesis on the possibility that consciousness itself uh, could be measured because everything is frequency. You know, if you study the chakras and if you look at the shock, seven chakras, they all have a frequency profile. Everything in in creation has a frequency, including a, say a virus has a frequency address or profile. Hmm. So then we get into this, you know, Dr. Bruce Lipton's work and the biology belief, you know, right. the geneticist saying, whatever I pay attention to, I affect the field of that Petri dish by my intention. Well, what's happening is you're affecting it with your consciousness. What's consciousness? Well, you could say, Hawkins would say, conscious is your degree of awareness of divinity, of your relationship with the divine. And he argued that conscious follows a logarithmic statistical curve that, you know, from one to a thousand, you develop a normative or a logarithmic scale, whether that's the right numbers or not. He said, isn't it interest? I'll just say it's one to a thousand, and a thousand is the highest possible vibration frequency that a human being can achieve, i.e. enlightenment. So whoever achieved that, Jesus, maybe Buddha, you know, and, and other mystics. And so they were, they were in a state of so-called bliss or, you know, enlightened awareness. So you, you put that all back together and you say, well, is it possible to measure the frequency of something? Uh, and the answer is probably yes. And how do you do that? So applied kinesiologists or naturopathic doctors have used protocols called muscle testing or 
mm -hmm. uh, dowsing. And what is that? Well, that's just your body as a tuning fork picking up on the frequency of something. So it could be holding two apples and saying which apple is vibrating at a higher frequency for, for my body. And you can essentially discern whether even you should eat apples, let alone eat, you know, this Granny Smith apple or this Fuji, whatever, whatever, you know, species it is. Do they have instruments out there right now that can actually detect that sort of frequency? Um, whether it be in, you know, apples, fruits. That, well, this is this is the question. There, th this is the question I'm asking. Uh, I just heard Sasha Stone, who you may know. Uh, Sasha Stone is in Bali, but he uh, just interviewed a couple. Elena Benzinov from Holistic.com, which is she's based in Florida. She's originally from the Ukraine, and her colleague Alejandra, who claimed that they have technology called scalar wave technology to be able to measure consciousness, not not just of food, but of anything, persons, organizations, movements, presidents, whatever. You, hmm. um, again, using Hawkins scale. So, so my question to Elena has been, what what do you mean by scalar wave te technology? Because we know that we ourselves are scalar wave technology, like our bodies are those those tuning forks. So, what we call calibration. I can calibrate. Um, the, the integrity of food, the integrity of land or soil, anything based on these protocols that Hawkins developed, which says you ask the question in the, in the scientific methods, that's you, you state a hypothesis, the sky is blue or Lauren has a cat, Lauren has a dog, and you don't have to respond to that question, but the field knows what the answer is because okay. you're already telling me the answer through your, right? body language your frequency that's coming off of that question so that's what hawkins said is possible so we are then the instruments hmm, okay which raises all kinds of amazing like questions what do you mean so you can discern then some people would say well i discern my discernment is through prayer i ask god and i get the answer uh, i also believe that but but i also believe that this tool of discernment is with all in all of us my naturopathic doctor taught me how to do this he said well i use this with my patients um, some may not believe me if i say look i i'm here because i want to tweak my diet and my friend would say well i can do the muscle testing right here um, on the foods you should eat or not eat based on their vibrational profile or I can do it discreetly without you knowing and give you the prescription. Here's your, you know, so, right. you know, it's interesting because some people say, oh, that is just complete nonsense and woo woo. I said, really? So let us go talk to our quantum physics friends and see those who talk about the field, right? Which right. And I'm, I'm not a physicist. So, but I know physics, physicists are catching up to this, this possibility. And yeah, one of my first books I read was biology of belief. Um, that's, that's Bruce, that's Bruce Lipton, right? Lipton. Yeah. 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 Um, and which is amazing, right? Here's a guy who's, he doesn't come from a faith position. He right. comes from a science position and he's blown away as a scientist. Right. Yeah. I, I love the, his book that the, 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 my interpretation was that the first part of it was, these are how cells work on a, you know, uh, bio, you know, a microscopic level. And then about halfway through the book, he goes to his chiro this chiropractor who performs muscle testing on him, which he finds absolutely and totally unbelievable. <laughs> and then the second half of his book basically supports in a um, in the, the metaphysical or energetic way, supports the first half of his book. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. it's, it's it's amazing. And now of course he's all over the place because you know he's uh, well, yeah. And and he's I mean look at the joy in his face he is yeah he's just lit up about life and and that's the way i feel i mean people say well you're how come you're always so blissed out i said because life is so spectacular the more and more i learn about this it seems that we are all connected to amazing information i mean i know one of the first <laughs> i was talking to this guy who was very extremely intuitive and uh 
And I, I said, hey, you should check out this book. And that book actually did happen to be Biology of Belief <laughs> uh, by Bruce, Bruce Lipton. And he starts doing muscle testing on himself. And he's like, yeah. I was like, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Man, goes, yeah. I'm getting a 20%. What do you mean I'm get, you're getting a 20%? He goes, well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm pretty far down the rabbit hole. I've read a lot of books. And for me to read that book, um, he says, it's only seems to be like 20% worth my time. And I said, you're, you're doing that. With your fingers? <laughs> you're doing that with your fingers. He goes, well, I'm muscle testing, you know, um, I'm not, not discrediting the book in any way. Cause it's an amazing book, but that, that was my first stepping stone. And this guy obviously had been in that realm, knows this information on some level for, for many years. Um, and for him, that book didn't resonate with him. And he was muscle testing it at 20%. And I was like, oh my God. So not only <laughs> you can determine whether this particular book that I'm just stating to you that you really have no tangible knowledge of um, is a good read, but you can actually determine what percentage scale that that would be helpful to you. He goes, yeah, that, that's, that's right. He goes, usually I only read books that register at about 60% or higher. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, wow. Oh my gosh, I, dude. I like this guy. I, I looked up a little, I guess it's kind of like a light attest. Light, light yeah, yeah. Or it, it can sense your your emotion or your subconscious. There you go. Well, maybe um, that's that scalar wave device that, that they're talking about. Maybe. And 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 from what I understand, that technology has been around since the 50s. Uh, there's been very little done, little done. And, and I just don't understand if if it says effective as i believe it is and it sounds like you believe it is why aren't devices like that just all over the place uh being used, <laughs> utilized is that a rhetorical question well yeah i guess that is <laughs> <laughs> i just said i think i just claimed that if these modalities without devices are available to all of us it would change the medical profession yes, yes. instantly okay. so there we so, have it that's the reason. there's, there's <laughs> Too many vested to happen, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the other thing is like it makes sense. Like as again, as an economist, who guy who studied the whole money system my whole life and taught from an energy, not just energy, but the mechanics of how money is created. You you come to realize that this is all about maintaining control of the matrix or the system that is in their interest to control. It's, it makes sense from a business perspective. It makes sense that there are people and systems in place who never want this these gifts of the spirit as saint paul talked about to be come to full fruition because it would be the end of the control or, or the system that they benefited from and i'm saying they because i think there doesn't take that many to may build and maintain a system my whole focus tends to be on follow the money right and so follow the money means follow the system which creates the money, maintains the money system. And as an accountant, does not create money in relation to well-being whatsoever. Because if they did, none of us would go to sleep anxious ever again. There'd be no such thing as not enough money um, for a living wage to do what you're supposed to do. So that's kind of the, the work I've been doing and writing about that. Uh, I was steeped and I've worked in the, the finance ministry in, in Alberta here. And so I, I saw that big picture. I knew GDP accounting. I knew national income accounting systems. I swam in that. So even back then, I, and I knew Robert Kennedy in 1968 said, we're not measuring the things that make life worthwhile. We're measuring economic growth, GDP, as if that's the only thing that matters to the nation. But we've never asked the question about the integrity of our political discourse or the joy of our children's play, as if you can measure those things. But he was, you know, he's basically pointing out that just measuring how much money changes hands, which is what the GDP does, is the flawed measure of progress. And I went, yeah, of course, Bobby, like, how, well, how would this politician possibly get that aha and, and give that at a speech, you know, a few months before he was shot at Kansas City. And that, that statement has been my sort of flashpoint, credo, so to speak. Wow. 
So yes, we can address Robert's challenges, measure well-being, build different ways of measuring the progress of nations, tie that directly into monetary policy, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, and then the nightmare is over. Maybe. It depends on who you elect as president. Nope, that actually doesn't matter either. It, it will take courage for all of us to walk, to, to, to develop, to co-create this economy well-being. But we won't, we won't do it when we're caught up in emotion and anxiety and fear. We have to tell the truth. Wow. Which is where muscle testing comes in again. Qui cum qui vera, what is true? Well, Hawkins says, you can calibrate that. It seems as if we can. Yeah. If this is a serious uh, discipline, you know, he, I would say, is the, the probably the most uncelebrated scientist of the 20th century hmm. um, because he grasped quantum physics in its, I think, in its full uh, simplicity. And so for me, then it, you know, we go into, like, if there's any woo-woo stuff for me, it's like the power of love, like the, the, the power of intention, the power of prayer. Um, that's all happening too within the, the quantum field. And the possibilities for healing through love is absolutely real to me. That's what I believe in. I'm, it's like love will heal. Yeah, love is the healing that um, it is our nature. So there's really not much more to say other than just love each other. Well, are there any um, closing remarks, statements that you wanted to, uh, or messages that you wanted to, uh, you know, share? I'm just thrilled to have this conversation. Um, you won't find me talking about this a lot on YouTube or in my presentations, because I think like Tony Robbins sort of kept it, uh, you know, kept it discreet with respect to people who would, might, as my wife would say, maybe dismiss you from being the economist you're known for. Right. So I think that itself is an interesting reflection on, for all of us is like, when we, my reflection is when we individually start to talk about our spiritual experiences or whether it was in childhood, right? I think we, we find more in common than not. And I think that's worth opening up and talking more openly with each other about. And then we're like, so when I saw an angel, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, crazy or, and so I think that to me is encouraging that these kind of conversations are happening. Yes. In, in a measured, sober, you know, way. So thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you for creating the space <laughs> with all the interruptions. And the <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. I really appreciate it, Mark. You're welcome. <laughs>